last time we started talking about Cnidarians, okay, and we said that um, Cnidarians are in phylum Cnidaria, and you have all sorts of different kinds of animals that are found in this phylum, like sea anemones and jellyfish and corals and sea whips and sea fans and hydrozoans, Portuguese man of war. Okay, lots of different kinds of things that are found in this phylum. Okay, um, <coughs> there's two forms that a cnidarian can be found in, right? The medusa form, which is the free-floating jellyfish form, and then the polyp form, which is like a sea anemone. Okay, um, and then we talked about how um, they have stinging cells, which puts them into this phylum cnidarium. Um, and those stinging cells shoot out, inject poison into their prey, paralyze the prey, they get pulled into the mouth, and then into the gastrovascular cavity where those are digested. Okay, so we talked about those stinging cells last time. Here's a little bit more information about them. So the stinging cells are only located on the tentacles of the cnidarian. There are very few types of cnidarians where um, the stinging cells will actually be like on the bell of the jellyfish, but that's very few and far between. Um, they're typically only found on the tentacles, and they are triggered by touch. So when you touch that tentacle, that is when you get stung. There's like a little trigger on there, and when you when you touch that trigger, it shoots out that um, nidocyte and gets injected into your finger, and poison is in your finger. Okay, um, they produce neurotoxins, so that affect the nervous system. And the reason why um, jellyfishes neuro like stings hurt so much more is because they have a stronger neurotoxin. And the reason for that is jellyfish have much more delicate tentacles, uh, and so they need to kill their prey much faster so that it's not like thrashing around pulling their tentacles off. So they are uh, they have much stronger neurotoxins. Whereas anemones, their tentacles are much thicker. They don't have to worry about the thrashing around of the animals so much, um, and so they don't have as strong of a neurotoxin. You also have certain kinds of animals that can eat cnidarians. Okay, so sea turtles are awesome. They can eat cnidarians. Um, they'll eat jellyfish. They have specialized mouths so that the stinging cells can't sting them, and their skin, they have scales all over their skin because they're reptiles, right? And so they um, don't get stung by the nematocyst. And then they've got a specialized digestive system that is able to um, digest the stinging cells. Okay, um, So they're able to eat the uh, jellyfish. The mola mola will um, also eat jellyfish. So the mola mola, the sunfish, eats jellies. Um, those tend to eat deep sea jellies, so they spend time down in the deep eating jellyfish, and then they come up to the surface to get their parasites removed and lay in the sun. Um, and then sea slugs will eat things like anemones and hydroids. Here's what's cool about sea slugs. Um, sea slugs will actually eat these things, okay? And they have a way, we don't really know how they do it, where they prevent the nematocysts from firing. Okay, so when they eat them, the nematocysts do not fire. And so they take them, eat them, ingest them, and then they take those nematocysts that they have ingested and they actually stick them into their body wall. So when you touch a sea slug, you actually have the potential of getting stung by a hydroid, okay, or a sea anemone. Yeah, it's crazy. Um, not a sea slug, but you'll get to touch a sea anemone on Thursday. I don't think they have any sea cucumbers, because they might, but I don't think they do. Yes? What's the one in the Right. Okay. So Cnidarians have radial symmetry. We already talked about that, but they have radial symmetry. Um, and then when we look at a Cnidarian, they've got two sides to them. Okay, so they have the oral and the aboral side. Um, the oral side is going to be the side that has the mouth and the tentacles on it. And then the aboral side will be the side that does not have the mouth or tentacles. That would, for a sea anemone, that's the side that's attached to a surface. Um, and for the jellyfish, that aboral side is the side that you see, the top of the bell, okay, would be the aboral side. Um, Nidarians are what we call suspension feeders. So they actually stick part of their body into the water column in order to capture food. It's called suspension feeding. Sponges were what kind of feeders? Filter. filter feeders, okay? So filter feeding is different from suspension feeding. Filter feeding, you're actually pulling the water into your body if you're a sponge, and you're filtering out the food. In suspension feeding, you're sticking part of your body into the water to capture food. And so the part of their body that they stick into the water is 
play pentacles okay, to capture their food. And then they capture that food and bring it in to their mouth, into their gastrovascular cavity, where it's digested. Okay? So, suspension feeders. I would definitely know the difference between filter feeding and suspension feeding. Good. Start. All right. So let's look at how cnidarians carry out all of the essential life functions that we've been talking about. So movement, respiration, feeding, reproduction, all of that stuff. Um, so respiration, circulatory system, respiratory, circulatory, and excretory system. Um, cnidarians don't have them. So they have no organized systems for any of their circulatory, excretory, or respiratory systems. They don't need them. Okay. So remember, um, cnidarians have a tissue level of organization, right? And cnidarians are actually um, only a few cells, thi cells thick. So if you look um, at this picture, right, on the very, very outside of the sea anemone or the jellyfish, um, you have the ectoderm. Okay, that's where you'll find like a lot of the cells of the jellyfish. And then on the inside, okay, lining the inside, you have the endoderm, okay, or the gastrodermis. Um, and so that's only a few cel cells thick. In between there, you have what's called the mesoglia. That's the jelly stuff, right? Um, typically, those don't have cells in them. They okay, sometimes will, but they're special kinds of cells that can actually move. So um, you have the endoderm and the ectoderm, and those are only a few cells thick. So these Cnidarians actually don't need full-on systems to get all of your oxygen from the water into the cells and carry it around the body um, because it's only a few cells thick, so they can just rely on diffusion, and they don't, they don't need a big system to carry that out. Also, for exc excretion, excretory system, right, waste products can diffuse out because um, they're only a few cells thick. And also, circulatory system, they don't need a circulatory system because, look, where is that gastrovascular cavity located? The bottom. Yeah, in the bottom, but it's like located throughout the entire animal, right? So it even extends into the tentacles. So when that food gets digested, all of those nutrients are throughout the entire animal already, and so they can, they don't need a circulatory system to take those nutrients to all of the cells. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah? So they don't need an excretory, circulatory, or um, respiratory system. And the same thing goes for the Medusa form as well. Okay? So they don't need those systems. They just diffuse. Okay, nervous system. So, cnidarians do not have a nervous system. Okay? They just simply have what we call a nerve net. So they have like nerve cells that will kind of form this net-like structure throughout the body of the cnidarian. Um, and they may have a few kinds of cells that can detect light and dark, so kind of like their eyes. Or they'll have some cells that can detect like touch, so that's why like when you touch them, they contract in on your finger. Um, but that's it. They have no brain. They don't really have any ganglia or anything like that. Um, it's just simply a nerve net. Okay, and that nerve net is mostly for detecting prey um, and then also to coordinate the contraction of the epidermal cells in order to allow for that animal to move. Okay, so they react to their environment through these light detecting cells and their nerve net. The musculoskeletal system, so how they move. Um, they have no muscles. Whoops. They have no muscles. Um, but they do have their epidermal cells on the ectoderm on the outside of their body can contract. Certain kinds of them can contract. Um, and so they will be signaled to contract by that nerve net and they will swim. The medusa form will swim with jet propulsion. Okay. So what they do, it's like a bell shape, right? Um, when that medusa is relaxed, okay, it's got water underneath um, the edges of the bell. Okay, when those epidermal cells contract, they squirt that water out from underneath the edge of the bell and it pushes that medusa forward. So it's called, it's like jet propulsion. Okay, it squeezes it out and pushes it forward. Then it relaxes, lets the water come back in, squeezes it out, moves it forward. So 
tail axis. So that's how you get that like jellyfish movement. Like that's why they're doing that. Okay, in order to move around. Um, reproductive system. So they can do both asexual and sexual reproduction. Um, asexual reproduction, the polyp can do budding. So they'll form like a little mini me off the side and drop off and become a new one. Okay, um, or sexual reproduction. The medusa will either be male or female. Okay, and um, they'll produce either eggs or sperm. And those will be released into the water column. And where the egg and sperm will come together, form a little larva. That larva will settle down on the sea floor and become a little polyp. Okay, that polyp will divide asexually and then create new medusa, which are the sexual, sexually mature form of the jellyfish and the form that you see most often. Okay, so that's how like most will reproduce. Um, for like anthozoan sea anemones, they'll just they have no medusa form. So you've got like your little sea anemone. They release eggs and sperm, form a little larva, settle down, become a new polyp. Okay, so no medusa form. Okay, so. Here's a, an example of a life, uh, life cycle of a jellyfish. So larva settles down, becomes polyp, produces medusa, releases gametes, so on and so forth. And then a simplified version of it for you. All right. Okay, ecology of cnidarians. So that's how they carry out all of their essential life functions. And there's actually, um, you'll be doing a little bit more reading on that as well, this cycle. Um, but ecology of cnidarians. Cnidarians have lots of symbiotic relationships with different kinds of animals. Um, clearly, like Nemo and the anemone, right, have a symbiotic relationship. So you get fish that live inside of anemones, okay? Um, and you, we also talked about when we talked about mutualism, like the hermit crab with its little anemone on its back. Okay, corals have a symbiotic relationship with an algae called zooxanthellae that gives coral nu nutrients, and then um, the zooxanthellae get a place to live. And actually, without those zooxanthellae, um, coral wouldn't be able to survive. So we wouldn't have these big, beautiful coral reefs where all of these like animals live. Um, those wouldn't really exist. What? They would pretty much all be all be dead. Yeah. They're little plants. So little single celled plants that live inside of the corals tissue that give the corals food. They do photosynthesis and give them food. So yeah. The coral is an animal but it has plants that live inside of it. Yes. It's trippy and weird. Um, also, cnidarians uh, toxins are actually being used in medical research for a variety of things. Um, so actually box jelly venom, we've actually found a chemical in box jelly venom, bless you, that is, a, um, is an antibiotic and it prevents, kills bacteria. And a lot of the bacteria that are resistant to a lot of our current antibiotics are not resistant to this antibiotic. So we're using it to come up with a new antibiotic um, also, we're using it to come up with new painkillers, box jelly venom. So it's a neurotoxin, got neurotoxins in it, and neurotoxins attack the nervous system, and if they block like signals from being sent on nerves, then you can use that as like, you know, keep your nerve cells um, from sending pain signals up to your brain. You can block pain, okay, and have it be a painkiller. So kind of cool deadly things that are actually being used for <laughs> medical science. Bless you. Okay. <clears throat> Specimen spotlight on the lion's mane jelly and then on the Portuguese man of war and then we'll start talking about box jellies. So, um, and not tomorrow, but the day after on Wednesday, you'll actually be watching a video all about jellyfish and it talks a lot about the box jellyfish. So, so Biggest jellyfish in the world, the title of the biggest jellyfish in the world goes to the lion's mane jelly. Okay. Yes. It's huge. <laughs> it is huge. Um, it is planktonic. Yes, that is a person. So it's huge. Okay. Yes. Um, its tentacles can reach like 120 feet long, which is longer than the longest ever like longest blue whale ever recorded. 
so their tentacles can be longer than a blue whale. Um, you know, granted, not all of their tentacles will be that long, but they can be. They, you know, hundreds of pounds. Okay, they are huge. They live in the Arctic. And okay, so that's the lion's mane jelly. Okay, um, Portuguese man of war. Portuguese man of war is um, a hydrozoan, actually. So it's actually a colony of animals. So you've got one animal that's at the top, that's this float. Okay, so this would be one animal right here. Um, and then each of these tentacles that are hanging down, some of these are feeding tentacles, and each of those would be a separate individual. Um, and then some of these are actually reproductive tentacles, and those would be other individuals. So it's a colony of, anim of animals that live together. They do produce toxins and deliver a very, very painful sting. Um, their toxins are actually about 75% as strong as cobra venom. So cobra venom is nothing to mess around with, neither is this. It's not really going to kill you unless you have like some allergic reaction to the toxin. Okay, so that's typically what happens if you die from this. It's just going to be super, super painful um, and not fun. So you can get it. If you get stung, sometimes the um, toxin can actually move like into your lymph nodes and cause like lots of problems for you. Um, but that's very, very rare that it'll do that. So, yeah. It does cause welts on the skin. It may leave some scars. Oh. Okay. So, this is the up close view of a nine year old boy's knee, like after he got stung. That, I think that's a couple days later because um, it's no longer like a welt. Yeah. Um, this is kind of an up close view. So, it can actually cause blistering and actually break the skin of the, break open your skin. And like from this guy, he's <laughs> proud of his uh, proud of his. It does look photoshopped. It looks like he, they put him into like a different beach, but yeah. But that's actually a jelly, a Portuguese man of war thing. Anyway. Okay, Kibazoa, craft Kibazoa. These are our box jellies. Box jellies are so cool. Um, in Cubozoa, it's the Medusa form dominates. Okay, so they're mostly in the Medusa form. And the reason why they're called Cubozoa is because if you take their bell and you cut them okay, across their bell, take a cross section and you look at it from the uh, looking down at the top of this bell, it has like a box shape. Okay, so cube, Cubozoa, box jellies. All right, so these are all box jellies. So form of the medusa of your box jelly. So their bell is square, okay, and on each of the corners of their bell, um, they have these things that are called pedalia, okay, where all of their tentacles attach. So if you look at this, I'll scroll back up for your notes. Here's your box jelly bell, and then at each of the four corners, those are the pedalia. Those are like the fleshy areas where your tentacles actually attach. Um, on the underneath of the bell, you have this flap of tissue that's there that's called the valerium. Okay, and that valerium is there to actually increase the speed of the box jelly's swimming. So it, what it does is it takes and actually narrows the opening at the bottom of the bell so that when that box jelly contracts and squirts the water out through the bottom of the bell, it increases the pressure and causes the box jelly to actually swim faster. And the box jelly can actually swim faster than an Olympic swimmer, so so it can it, you could a box jelly could beat Michael Phelps in a in a race. The box jelly, um, the largest one, the Turnex fleckeri, the deadly one, will be the bell can reach up to about the size of your head, and the tentacles can be about ten feet long. So it's booking pretty fast, yeah, because of that valerium underneath narrowing the opening, which yeah. creates more pressure. Yep. Yeah. Um, the the bo big box jellies, no. But you'll see. Maybe. <laughs> you'll see. Watch the movie on Friday and you'll see all about that. Uh, Wednesday. Sorry. Stop. Double box. Okay. So, Pedalia, 
Okay, where your um, tentacles attach in between there, you have what are called the rotopalium, palium, um, which are right there. So if this is underneath the box jelly, here's your pedalia, here's the rotopalium. The rotopalium are where um, all of the sensory structures of your box jelly are located. So box jellies actually have six eyes on each side of their bell, giving them a total of 24 eyes. <laughs> These are not simple eyes, not all of them. So they actually have two eyes that are actually quite complex. One, which actually has a lens and a retina and like a pupil, okay? And you've got a picture of it actually in your notes. So if you look, this is the picture in your notes. I'll go back to this so you can get all the notes. So this is the, the rotopalia, okay? These, this is its eye, okay? One of its eyes. So can you see it's kind of got like the, the pupil, right? And then it's also got a lens and a retina in there. Yeah, and an iris, okay? Um, these are its other eyes. If you look at it straight on here, you can see all six eyes. These are located on each side of the bell, 24 eyes. So the, they're light sensitive spots. The other ones are light sensitive spots. Um, these ones are actually like more complex eyes, this big one and then the other big one right there. Um, but we don't really know how they process that information, yeah, I was right? Say, they have no brains. So there's nothing that whatever the shape takes in is upside down to the wall? Really? Probably, yeah. So um, it's, it's strange. Um, maybe not because it's... No, it probably is. Um, so, and what's weird, guys, even weirder, yes, um, is there, these uh, rotopalium are attached to a stalk, and so they can actually rotate these. And so the box jelly can actually like look through its stomach because it's clear, and so it's got a 360 degree view all the way around of what is around it. Yeah. So it can swim fast, it can see, and it's like the most venomous creature in the world. <laughs> Comforting, right? Okay, so it can look all the way around. Underneath the eyes on the rotopalium are these things called statocysts. Okay, and statocysts on the inside of them, they have these things called statoliths, which are these kind of like little rock things made out of calcium sulfate. Um, and that actually helps the box jelly to detect orientation, meaning which way is it facing, up, down, sideways, okay, it'll, the statocyst will tell it. Um, and if you look at those statoliths, they actually have daily growth rings on them, so you can tell how old the box jelly is by looking at them. All right. So that's where, what's that? So in this picture, see underneath the eye how um, like you've got, it looks like a bunch of these like little rocks. Can you kind of see that? Okay, right here. Okay, this is the statocyst. And then these kind of like rock things inside here, those are the statolith. Okay, and so as the jellyfish moves, these actually hit little hair cells in there, um, which will tell the jellyfish which way it is facing. Okay, um, and then here's what it would look like the whole rhodopalium on the box jelly itself. So, yep. Okay, stinging cells. So the box jelly stinging cells, um, they do have nematocysts. They do produce toxins, and it is deadly. So their nematocysts are actually concentrated in rings on the tentacles. So if you were to look at the tentacles, there are like it has stripes, okay, and the stripes are where um, the nematocysts are concentrated. And they do that for a reason. Uh, when those box jellies sting, okay, the tentacle actually contracts, with, which squeezes more venom into the prey. Yeah. So it actually takes, not only does it just like inject, like, you know, sting you, but then it contracts and pushes even more venom into the prey. Um, in like the big box jelly, like Tyrannex fleckeri, uh, your the nematocysts are actually not on the bell, so they're only located in the tentacle. So here's what a tentacle would look like. Okay, so here's where like the nematocysts would be located. 
can contract and squeeze. And then here's an unspired nematocyst under the microscope. All right. Okay. So the valerium is that flap of tissue underneath that narrows the opening and allows for the box jelly to swim much faster. Okay. And we think that's at least partly responsible for the reason why they can swim so fast. Um, this picture that I'm about to show you is actually the underside of a box jelly. So if you're looking like up at the box jelly and the tentacles are moved to the side, this is what you would see. Okay. So this is the underneath. Here's like the pedalia. Okay. And then the rotophilia. Okay. Um, on each side. And then see this flap of tissue right here. Okay. That's the valerian. It does look like a fake. Yeah. The eyes and like the nose and the mouth, but it's actually the underside of the box jelly. Yeah. So, and then this is that flap of tissue, the valerium, that narrows the opening and allows so for it like to swim fast. Like, like here and then here as well? Yeah, on each of the four corners, so, or four sides. Right. So if these are where the tentacles are, then it's got an eye, eyes here, 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 and here. Right. And so you're looking at, at it kind of like this way. Right. Okay. No, they can't string through with. Yeah. yeah. Um, this is the mouth of the box jelly. Okay, so if you're a prey item, this would be probably one of the last things that you see. Um, it's going through the mouth of the box jelly. Okay, box jellies actually are um, ecologically important. So they keep their prey populations under control. So they eat fish. They're actually active predators of fish swimming around um, hunting prey. And so they're active predators of fish. They eat things also like worms and certain kinds of crustaceans. We swim around eating them. Um, and it's kind of hard to see in this picture because they are see-through. But you can kind of see the tentacles. This is like a swarm of box jelly pieces. Yeah. So see like the lines oh, into the box jelly. Yeah, no thanks. Okay, how they reproduce is interesting. Um, so they actually pair up to reproduce, and the male will pass a, a packet of sperm to the female. Uh, the firm female will take it into her gastrovascular cavity where she will fertilize the eggs, okay? And then depending on the type of the box jelly, the species of the box jelly, um, either the fertilized egg will be released into the water where it will then become a larva, okay? And that larva will swim around. Or um, that fertilized egg will develop into a larva inside of the gastrovascular cavity and then it will be released into the water. Either way, larva in the water for a few days um, and then that larva will settle down onto the sea floor. It could kind of be considered live birth a little bit. Um, it'll settle down onto the sea floor. That little polyp can actually bounce around, guys, can bounce around, jump around on the sea floor. And as it does that, it can actually um, like make new little polyps. So when it bounces to the next spot, it'll leave a piece behind and that can grow into a new polyp. So it bounces around, creating new polyps, and then that polyp will actually metamorphosize and become the box jelly, Medusa. Okay, so it actually changes form and swims away and is the Medusa. All right, right here. And there's your picture of a box jelly. So. Rukia barnsai. Um, this is one of the types of box jellies. It's a little teeny, teeny, tiny box jelly. Um, and it causes this thing that is, was known as Irukandji syndrome. And so it's found in the northern parts of Australia near Cairns by the Great Barrier Reef. Um, and so it's called Irukandji syndrome because there is an Aboriginal tribe, the Irukandji, who lived in Australia in that area. And people would get, like, go into the water and then come out 
and have like these symptoms of like excessive sweating, uh, muscle cramps, a horrible, horrible headache, and like intense, intense pain for a few days. Um, so it's called Irukandji syndrome. They didn't know what was causing it. Um, and then the guy who found it, um, Dr. Barnsai, and ironically enough, named after him, um, he, so he, he thought it was caused by a jellyfish, so he found this little box of jelly, and in order to prove his point that it was actually this jellyfish that was causing Irukandji syndrome, he stung himself with it, he stung his son with it, and he stung the lifeguard on duty with it, and then they all came down with Irukandji syndrome, and that was his proof that that box jelly on purpose okay right thanks dad that's what it looks like it's small okay when you first get stung so it's just kind of like a little pinprick and then about 20 to 30 minutes later that's when it starts like um, really setting in and it is lethal we do know of like at least one person who's died from it but it's typically not yeah, those would be its, where its eyes would be located. Uh, okay, this one I can't pronounce. So this one is found in Guam. Okay. It's small, so a big, a fully grown one would only be one centimeter. So it's teeny, 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 tiny. It spends most of its days attached underneath rocks um, with like sticky pads on top of its spell. Um, and it's not deadly, but it does deliver a very painful sting. Um, and if you are snorkeling at night around Guam, like with a flashlight or scuba diving, they're actually attracted to light, so they can come and come and get you. So that's what they look like. Um, yeah, but not as fast as this guy. So this is the deadly one. Okay, um, it's not that great of a picture of it, but Chirinex fleckeri, the deadly one. So it'll be like the size of a human's head have tentacles 10 feet long. If you get stung with about five or six feet of a tentacle, you will die in about two to three minutes. Okay, so it is, it is intense. What? You can hold it because it doesn't have um, stinging cells on the cell. All of its tentacles will have all of the stinging cells on it. So you can pick it up and like, as long as you don't touch the tentacle, it's fine. So you'll see a lot about this one on the movie. Okay, guys, hold on. Last type. Um, this guy looks like the Chironex fleckeri, but he's actually not deadly. So it looks like it, it just will deliver a very, very painful sting as well. Okay, and here's where I got all my information about cubozoans.